Now that we've had a chance to follow our three main characters through the first leg of the Cullen game, it feels like we're mere weeks away from Kenjaku finally popping up and revealing his master plan. But before that happens, I'd like to take some time to kind of comb through the details we got early on and use that information to set some expectations for the rest of the arc. But first, a box. Go crazy, go crazy, go crazy, yeah. Ah, go crazy, go crazy, go crazy, yeah. Ah. Jujutsu Shonen here, and if you haven't solved already, please do. I'm only 14 away from 100, and that's my only goal for this year. I don't have to do anything else after that. Okay, so the first thing I want to clarify is when I say expectations, I'm not trying to set up the color game as garbage if these things don't happen. I just mean that these are some things that we can look forward to now that the arc has progressed and we've had some time to put some context and you know connect some dots. Because I don't know about you, but when the arc first started, I was confused but excited, so I kind of just went with it. And now, you know, I felt like oh, I should probably just go back and reread it, see if any of that stuff has uh, been cleared up. And I found out two things. First thing is, yes, it totally worked out. Like, go back and reread the, the beginning of the Cullen game. It's a great experience. And the second thing I found out is you can't kind of reread Cullen game without at least touching on the end of Shibuya. At the very least, the end of Shibuya. And that's kind of where I want to start. Maximum techniques. Now, you may have forgotten about or even missed this entirely, but did you know that curse techniques have a level beyond domain expansions? And I'm not talking about what Tengen was mentioning when he was talking about like, oh, old domains versus new shirt hit, shirt kill domains. No, I mean a level beyond domain expansions entirely. Like the Jujutsu version of a Bankai. Well, I guess like domains are kind of already the Bankai. So this would be like Mugets. In chapter 134, Kenjaku introduced the idea of maximum techniques, referring to them as the most supreme art. What's more is he was also talking to Yuji directly here, so I guess he's also talking to Sukuna. Now, I don't know if Sukuna has a maximum technique, but given his title as the King of Curses and his whole encounter with Jogo where he's copying his powers and whatnot, I'm going to assume that he does. I believe we're going to start to see maximum techniques pop up this arc, but I don't see Yuji getting one, because that's going to require him to get a curse technique, master domain expansion and then go a level beyond that. I think it's more likely that we'll just see him inherit Sukuna's technique. As for where we'll see these techniques pop up, I think the older sorcerers roaming around the culling game are probably our best bet, which brings me to my next point. Hajime versus Hakari. It's bound to happen, right? In fact, it might even happen within the next two chapters. I mean, we've already gone through the three main characters. We don't really have anyone else roaming around. So unless Gage decides to focus on Panda for a detour, which I will not complain about at all, or revisit Maki, which I think is less likely. I think we're bound to kind of like see what Hakari is up to. At 400 years old, Hajime is the oldest sorcerer participating in the culling game. Also, her intro is pretty raw, so I just kind of want to see her pull out the craziest things we've seen thus far. Then again, that would mean she's kind of showcasing these advanced techniques against someone like Hakari, which doesn't really sound too good for him. I also don't see Gage building up someone stronger than Yuta by Yuta's own words just to kill him off at the first chance he gets. Then again, he totally could given his whole deal with Yuji, right? How could he join the crew under the condition that he'd have a hand in revising the Jujutsu regulations post culling game? And to do this, he was gonna need Yuji's help with the Fight Club and Megumi's influence as the head of the Zenin clan to make sure that his regulations are cemented. However, <laughs> the status of the Zenin clan as one of the three families or the three most powerful clans in the Jujutsu world is currently up the air. And to make matters worse, while Megumi, Yuji, and Hakari are working out the terms and conditions of their agreement, Maki was already on her way to destroy the entire clan. Granted, Maki's recent upgrade did make her stronger than the entirety of the Zenin clan anyway, it's kind of not the point. The point is, there's no clan left, so Megumi's probably unlikely to hold up his end of the deal. Part of me thinks this whole clan politics stuff is still going to come into play later on based off of what Jinji said about the relations between the Kamo and the Gojo and how Megumi's kind of on good footing, but I don't know, I feel like that whole thing kind of got scrapped and the entire clan got assassinated. Now, as funny as it would be to have Sukuna's whole existence water down to the daily main event at Hakuri's Fight Club, I just don't see that happening either. Unless, of course, the Fight Club is supposed to have a similar purpose later on. Now, between Kenjaku's speech about potential and Hakari's speech about gambling, I can see Gage kind of drawing a connection in the future. The main connection I see to Hakari's plan right now is Higurama. Now, Higurama never actually says anything about wanting to change Jujutsu regulations, but like Hakari, the current state of the world works in his favor. His flashback and his curse technique make him the perfect fit for the role of regulator, you know, rule creator, judge man, whatever you want to call it. So if Hakari dies, I can see Higurama kind of stepping in for him. Although given that, you know, the team kind of needs every person that they can get right now on their side, I don't see Gage killing him. Then again, it's Gage. He can kill anyone he wants. Point number four, the return of, yeah, you guessed it, Nobara. Totally kidding. I think she's more than likely dead at this point. And if she is alive, I don't think she's able to participate in the culling game. Plus she would need a huge power up just to compete. Like Maki's power ups respectfully made her stronger than Choso. So unless there's like some heavenly restriction or some binding vow that she can make where she combines reverse curse technique, which she would also have to learn 
with the idea that, oh, instead of using her straw doll, she uses her real body, then, you know, that that's the only way I can really see her coming back. Other than that, I think she's not coming back anytime soon. I would love to be wrong about that because she's part of the OG trio. Number five. Yuji versus Yuta, round two. The person I actually see coming back relatively soon is Sukuna, because you can't have all these ancient sorcerers roaming around with a competition about killing each other without the King of Curses making at least one appearance. It's also just likely that Kenjago made some sort of deal with Sukuna in the past, so I'm guessing that the next phase of his plan involves his return at some point. And that means we're getting Yuji versus Yuta, round two. Hell, I even throw in Megumi, because I know at some point he's supposed to be tied to Sukuna anyway. My wild theory for the day is that this is where Megumi's proposed rule about being able to pay points to leave the game will come into play. If either Megami or Yuta are trying to leave the game, most likely Yuta, then they're probably going to have to substitute a non-player into the game. And if this all plays out the way I'm imagining it, this is how Gage is going to introduce Gojo back into the story. And finally, Kenjaku's next move. As for what he's going to reveal the next time we see him, I'm totally lost. So to try to make sense of everything, I'm just going to quickly go over some of the details we have so far. Number one, the culling game is a distraction. And obvious, I know, but seeing as though this is one of the only things that Reggie gave us, I really want to take it into consideration here, especially since Higurama came up with the same idea independently, and this idea went completely over Tengen's head. Number two, Kenjaku's trying to unleash something even out of his own control. Now, the King of Curses sounds like something that would fit this description, but I think that would be a little anticlimactic. I just don't think Sukuna is the end goal here. I think he's more than likely a bargaining chip or a pawn, as much of a pawn as you can make Sukuna, but... I think that's the more likely scenario. Either that or the massive earthquake causing catfish that this guy has at his disposal, which is kind of fitting seeing as though Kenjaku is a catfish himself. Number three, given everything we know about Kenjaku, what could possibly be out of his control? Judging by how calculated he's been so far and just how long he's been around, I'm pretty sure he has a hand in why Jujutsu regulations are so corrupt today anyway. I mean, why else would the higher ups decide to keep Gojo sealed when he's the only thing that's been able to stop Kenjaku in the past? Number four, Kogane's purpose. Sure, Kogane's introduced is just the game's interface, but I believe there's something else going on with it. Maybe once a certain amount of points are used, the second effect is triggered. Number five, Tengen just has to go. Not just because Kenjaku is the big bad villain and we need to make the stakes even higher, but because I just don't see why Kenjaku would be negotiating with the superpower if he wasn't able to threaten the entire world with the culling game. Or at least spirit manipulation. See, Tengen spirit is already established to only exist in Japan, and Jujutsu sorcerers don't really exist out of Japan anyway. Maybe he can offer to make those international sorcerers a little bit stronger or create an army with them. No, not that kind of army. I just think if the Kalen game were at least spread across the world, that would be more than enough to make this whole sorcerer-filled world that Yuki and Geto were talking about. You know, that whole forced evolution thing. Number six, Reggie's technique was called contract renewal. And I think that's pretty important, and it should be, right? Like, Geto kind of started this arc by saying, hey, he kind of voided all his binding vows with curses and sorcerers and whatnot. So maybe it's kind of voided, but you know, I would at least like to see what that contract would have been or what type of agreement they might've worked out if there was one at all. You know, maybe there was some sort of drawback or something that happened once Reggie died. And finally, Fujiwara and the importance of talk. While I don't know if these will have any direct connections to Kenjaku's next move, I do expect some type of exposition or like some type of correlation when his, you know, the start of his plan is at least revealed. If not now, then at least at the start of the next arc where I think the calling game is gonna bleed into, right? Some, type, some sort of like new old world, new ancient times world type of thing. A couple of honorable mentions. First of all, even among the special great sorcerers that we're seeing right now, Yuji's physical prowess alone is a problem. Like, he fought Yuta and held back, and even without any cursed energy, he was able to go against Higurama, at least for a little bit. I think that's really not to be taken lightly, and the fact that Urami just refers to him as Sukuna's body, or like refers to his body as Sukuna's possession, I don't believe that's in the form of, you know, Sukuna possessing him. I believe, you know, it has something to do with his past, how he was created, because obviously Kenjaku has a hand in that. Hopefully that means we get more on this whole death painting relationship thing, because sure, his connection to Choso and, you know, the other death paintings will be great to get an explanation for, but I need to know more about this whole Toto and Junpei situation, why he's able to affect memories. That could even be something that Sukuna was just able to do and he just hasn't revealed yet, right? Like we've seen him take over Jogo's power, maybe, you know, it's like a Tsukushima thing from Bleach where he's able to kind of like insert himself into your past memories and be like, no, 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 you taught me this before. The second one is kind of just a question, which is that Higurama says that he got points before coming to Tokyo. You know, he does that whole courtroom massacre. And I know underneath that, you know, his introduction says culling game player, but I don't know. I, I feel like that didn't happen at the right time. Like if that was an oversight, then maybe that's explained or maybe it's just something that I'm not seeing. Yeah, that's it. I got nothing else. Like I said in the last video, these are just organized ramblings. Now, but seriously, I'm of the camp that the best shonen are very unpredictable. There's always that 
feeling or like, you know, that plot twist that no one ever sees coming. But I guess with everyone throwing darts at the board, someone's bound to hit the bullseye, right? So I guess I'll take a stab at it. I think whatever Kenjaku's planning involves the spread of optimized cursed energy around the world so that the rest of the world can manifest curses and cursed energy the same way as Japan. I don't know if this is going to be used as a threat or a bargaining chip, but I just know that if Kenjaku does succeed in merging with Tengen, then he'd be able to turn any country into the days of old. He'd also be able to pick any cursed technique from that country and extract it at will. Now, either he's meeting with this certain superpower because he's trying to leverage them, or he's just there to announce it. The latter seems less likely until you realize that that boastful part of Ghetto still lives within him, just like the other parts of the other people that he's possessed. Anyway, the point of this video, like I said in the beginning, was just to put together some information that may or may not have been buried with, you know, the current events. No matter which route we go, I know that so long as Gage isn't rushed to the end of his story, we're in for some really great shonen. Hell, it's possible Gojo even remains sealed until the very end of the story and like the, the joke at the end is like, oh, you saved the world. Cool, now I can come back. Like, I have no idea. All I know is what I know from what I read recently. If I could leave you with one intellectual note or one piece of advice, it would be go back and reread Shibuya. Go back and reread the Culling Game because they have a lot of replay value. And you also might find some things that I missed when prepping for this video. And also the new season doesn't drop until like, you know, 2023 anyway, so you might as well go back. You have nothing else to do. Anyway, that's all from me. I hope you have a great day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.